Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate being here. This is how it's going to go down for the next couple of minutes. <laughs> what I thought we would do is we'll talk about the agenda for a minute. I'd introduce myself, we'll give you a little backstory, uh, present the problem, cite the examples, give you some tools, or at least talk about tools. I'll proffer a conclusion, and then I'll try and get out of here. Andrew will come on and do a really awkward Q&A for about one minute at the end. <laughs> Hi. You guys are too kind. <laughs> I'm Rick, I'm a designer. I, mean, I feel like I should be sitting in a 12-step program. I'm a designer, and I'm also a commissioner of uh, culture in, for the city and county of Denver, which means that we green light all the public art projects. And we work in teams in order to create works of art around the city and county of Denver that are designed to uh, delight and surprise the public whether or not they have a relationship with art. It's in those teams that I want to talk about some of the behaviors that we're in and some of the sort of the new provocation that I have. I was born and raised in England, and you'll know that because I call that a pram. <laughs> my mom is from Trinidad and Tobago. My father is from British Guyana, which is on the mainland coast of South America next to Venezuela. And I identify as a black man. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I don't care which one, trust, subject matter, expertise, whatever. <laughs> when I moved to the United States, I was dropped into the suburban Washington, D.C. area in the 80s, which meant that I was fortunate enough to be a part of the incredibly queer, positive punk rock scene in Washington, D.C., and this is pretty much what I look like, and yeah. <laughs> it's a weird reversal thing. <laughs> and, uh, it's... You can't write a script better than that. That's just ridiculous. Uh, in the 90s, I moved to New York City, where I met a wonderful Jewish girl who was a feminist, <laughs> who also liked the outdoors, and we wouldn't last very long in New York City, so we moved to Colorado, and that was about 20 years ago. We raised a couple of beautiful children. I think they're up there somewhere. Hi, I love you. And three times I've been to therapy without even thinking about it. I'm like, I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go. I think of that as a kind of privilege. So let's talk about the problem. My feeling is that people are afraid of conflict. I think they think that it's physical, they think it's loud, and they think it isolates people. And, you know, for me, because I'm known for conflict being kind of my love language, I'm sort of like, hey, let's get in some conflict. Let's have a pillow fight. Let's have a good time together. <laughs> and, and it doesn't phase me at all. It doesn't bother me in the slightest bit because I know that there's a lot of trust there, or at least that's the idea that I have going into it. This is why, I mean, I think we're sort of conflating two concepts. One is that conflict equals violence. And really the problem is, is that linguistically, over a fairly long period of time, things that we used to call wars got called skirmishes, then they got called engagements, then they got called conflicts, and things like shell shock got called PTSD, and anyone can have PTSD about any trauma. I mean, linguistically, we've been batting around this notion of conflict so long that it feels like a crime, that it feels like people doing bad things to each other. And I'm here to say that conflict has always been an instrument for social good. Remember, agenda, examples. So Henry Rollins, back to the DC hardcore scene, Henry Rollins, with an incredible amount of aggression, has given generation after generation after generation an opportunity to have a voice, a voice that is poetic, a voice that is loud and optimistic. In fact, Henry Rollins is well known for saying, my optimism is loud and wears boots. Pema Chodron, if you follow her at all, provides us with a kind of contrast, a life contrast that says, do you want to learn to be groundless or do you want to carry the ground that you make around you with you everywhere you go? Grounded or groundless? Which is it? Eames tells us about the nature of collaboration and, and reminds us that from the information age that is profoundly collaborative, we also have to go to the age of choice. 
We have to actually be in conflict to make choices and decisions about what we will in include and exclude in our lives and the people that we will include and exclude in our practice. And Karl Marx is the author of what we would call conflict theory and is pretty clear about the way that it works. It's not a new thing, it's an old thing. Dubois and Sanger both in their own movements, deal with the notions of social justice and social equity with conflict key, dialed into their universe, really, how to manage conflict. And then there's this guy, Horst J. Rattel. Horst J. Rattel is also a designer, but a different kind of designer. He thinks of engineering, planning, and policymaking as forms of design, and he also talks about policy making and planning and talks about the types of problems that people engage in and coined a term called the wicked problem. The wicked problem is an, a problem that has a lot of people in it, moving targets and lots of people and human concerns, things that you have to sort of get into in order to understand the levers and the pulleys. He talks about wicked problems and says, and insists, in fact, that there must be argument and conflict in order for us to resolve any of these types of problems. And they're called social messes, too. It's sort of a nickname for the wicked problem is a social mess. So that's conflict on a sort of a pretty large scale. What I'd like to talk about is like how we sort of turn towards each other and disagree well, fight well, argue well, it's a super important tool that we use to collaborate. We use this concept of diversity. I want to encourage you that in this sort of tool, this germ of brilliance, there's also sort of another idea, which is that we're sort of not talking about your gender and we're not talking about your skin color. We're talking about a diversity of ideas and a diversity of purpose. We're talking about how you see yourself in the work. There are two black men, well, maybe three in this room, <laughs> and <laughs> right here, who have very different opinions about how to approach the work that is in this conflict. And they both had to exist, and they both had to be vocal, and they both had to do the work in order to be successful. Another tool that I'd like to offer you is this notion of there is only really one kind of empathy required here. Just one. And there are lots of kinds of empathy. The empathy I talk about is to accept that at any given time, the answer to the problem could be well lodged in the back of the throat of a person who doesn't want to speak up. Our only commitment in these groups is to listen to each other. We have to be present. That's the very special and singular kind of empathy that I'm trying to put forward in this. There must be goals. Two people that disagree, if you don't have goals, it's just ugly. There's nothing to it. It happens all day long, people with parking tickets or parking spaces. It's not, it's not interesting. In fact, watching Democrats and Republicans alike disagree without goals is sort of boring. It's not their highest and best use at all. And there must be rules. Remember, I, I, I was talking about it at first as like, conflict, and here's some examples of how it works on this very large scale for groups of people, large groups of people. But down here, where we make differences and challenges and accept challenges all of our own, goals and rules, they're super important tools for us to work with each other with. And here's a template of some rules that like, I've come up with in our practice. It's a, it's a sort of way of being with each other. I mean, it's, they're not hard and fast, but it's a good way to work inside of my business or my practice with me as the attendant. 
And everybody who works with me understands these ideas. Zoom in a little bit, you'll see some of the contrast or the, even the sort of implied conflict here. Know the price for your best work. First of all, know its value. Secondly, it's got to be your best work. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm not paying for your shittiest hour. You know what I'm saying? And then the other part is don't cheat and practice a kind of piety or, or humility with each other. Right? Just know that that's on the table for everybody. And then the last part of this, which to me is super important, is that we can't forget the opportunity to not know with as much confidence as when we do know. Just because you don't understand it, quite frankly, it doesn't mean it won't make sense. We have to embrace the unknown. We have to come towards a kind of groundlessness. The conclusion. I'll be out of here in a minute. Embrace conflict to increase your emotional fluency and promote civility. Let's look at each other like human beings with purpose. Let's be with each other. Let's argue. I hear the makeup sex is amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm out.